Hello, everyone. We're just giving a few moments for everybody to join us and then we will get started. All right, everyone, we're just going to give a few more moments and then we'll get started. Um, as a reminder, everyone is on mute, but you can ask questions via the Q&A box. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Rebecca, and this is Lauren. We are going to be talking about high quality images today. So we are excited to be with you all. These webinars that we host are in conjunction with our monthly newsletter. So be on the lookout for those in your inbox. You probably got one. That's how you ended up here. Um, just a couple of reminders. Uh, everyone is on mute, and that's on purpose, um, and you can't chat, but if you have questions, please add those to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, I just want to remind you all, these webinars are not meant to replace any type of training, so if you do need training on your iris camera, please contact your supervisor to get that arranged. All right, Lauren, I will turn it over to you. All right, so we did get a few uh, Q&A questions about being able to hear us, so I just want to double check that everyone is able to hear us and um, it looks like we are good to go. So I just wanted to do that real quick before we kept proceeding. So as Rebecca mentioned, today we're discussing how to capture high quality retinal images. So we're going to start off by talking about what a quality retinal image looks like. Uh, then we will go into discussing troubleshooting, different types of images and understanding what's happening in those. As Rebecca mentioned, if at any time you have a question, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. So 
what makes an image ideal? A retinal image should be clear and in focus. There should be four parts of anatomy that are present. And the optic nerve should be in the correct location for the eye that you've taken a picture of. So when you take a picture of a patient, it's helpful to ask yourself three questions. Can I see all four parts of anatomy? Are they clear and in focus? And is the optic nerve in the correct location? If the answer to those three questions is yes, you have an image that is likely to be gradable. So here we have a few examples of ideal images, one for the left eye and one for the right eye. As we can see, the anatomy is clear and in focus. All four parts of anatomy are visible and the optic nerve is correctly placed for each eye. So as a reminder, and many of you probably remember this, your optic nerve should be on the left side for the patient's left eye in the nine o'clock position or pretty close to it. For the patient's right eye, we want the optic nerve to show up on the right-hand side at about three o'clock. And so on this next slide, we have the anatomy labeled for you. Uh, we don't mind if you don't recall the names of the anatomy all the time, that's not important. What is important is that you remember what they look like and where they're supposed to appear. So we wanna capture the vasculature, those superior and inferior arcades at the top and bottom. We want the macula to be in the center of the image. And then again, we want the optic nerve to be correctly placed for either the right or the left eye, depending on which eye you're taking a picture of. So this is the most important component of the positioning for the anatomy is ensuring that the optic nerve is correctly located. So once again, ask yourself three questions. Can I see all four parts of anatomy? Are they clear and in focus? And is the optic nerve in the correct position? Okay, so for this next section, we want to talk about several examples of common image quality issues that we see and how to correct those. But this is going to be a little bit interactive. So uh, Lauren is going to put up a poll and we want you to take a look at this image and in the poll, select the image quality issue you think is affecting this image. So we'll give you a couple minutes to answer the question and then we'll go over it. All right, we've got a good mix of answers coming in. We'll give just a few more moments for everyone to lock in their answer. We'll show you the results once we close out the poll here. We've got a little over half. Let's just give it a couple more seconds. Anyone else put your votes in? All right, let's see what those answers are. And yeah, click share. Okay, so as you can see, we got a little bit of confusion going on here. But for those of you um, who picked dilation, you are correct. So the shadows you can see on this image are blocking the anatomy. And we like to say, when you see dark shadows, think dilation. So on the next slide, we have a couple more examples for you. You'll be able to see some dilation issues in different camera types. So all of these dark shadows appear a little bit different depending on the patient's eye and the camera that you're using. So it could be any type of shape or in any location on the image. But just remember when you see dark shadows, think dilation. So there are a couple of things you can do to resolve the dilation issue. So remember, we are trying to look through the patient's pupil to the back of the eye called the retina. And when the pupil is too small, we can't quite see through it and it, it causes shadows on the retina. So we want their pupils to be bigger. <clears throat> so there's a couple of options. First would be natural dilation. 
So everyone can make use of natural dilation. It, everyone has it. When you go in a dark room and you are sitting there for a few minutes, your pupils begin to expand and get a little bit bigger to allow more light in. So that's what we want to take advantage of with natural dilation. So our recommendation is when you're preparing to do an exam with a patient, bring them in the room, sit them down in the chair where they'll be having the exam and go ahead and turn off the lights, but maybe keep the door cracked so that you can still see each other for a few minutes while you're explaining the exam and answering any of their questions. And then when you're ready and your camera is prepared, you can go ahead and close the door. Your eyes will probably be more adjusted by that point, as well as the patient's pupils will be a little bit bigger. And you can go ahead and attempt to take the images. So if at that point, your patient's pupils are still too small and you're getting a lot of these dark shadows, that's when you would wanna let them sit in the dark for five to 10 minutes before you move on. At that same point in the process, if your organization uses dilation drops, you can instill those drops and then wait five or 10 minutes for the pupils to dilate as well. If you do use dilation drops, the patient does not have to stay in the dark. So you could move them back out to the waiting room or into another room. They can look at their phones. They could go see a provider and then come back to you for the exams. So there's a few options there, but that's where you would want to instill the drops and wait for those pupils to dilate. All right, moving on to another common example. We're gonna give you a few moments to look at this image and then I will launch the poll so you can tell us what you think is happening in this image. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. Lock in your votes. Tell us what you think is happening in this image. We'll give just a few more moments for everyone to make a selection. All right. So this one was a little bit more clear cut uh, and you are correct. The majority of you answered patient fixation. That is exactly what's happening in this image. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So you'll notice the optic nerve is in the central uh, lo location for this image. The optic nerve moves based on where the patient is looking. So all patient fixation means is that the patient is not looking in the correct location. And here we have a few more examples from a few different cameras on what that might look like. So in the first two examples, photos one and two, the optic nerve is either not visible at all or it is very far off to the side. So we cannot see much of the anatomy at all, just a little bit of the vas vasculature, but we don't have a clear view of everything, um, including the macula and the optic nerve. Uh, our example for number three, very similar to the example for the pole, the optic nerve is dead center. We cannot see all of the vasculature. We don't have quite as clear of a view of the macula. And then in the fourth image, that optic nerve is down in the six o'clock position, again, preventing us from seeing all of the anatomy. So one of the most uh, important things to do during your exam is help the patient understand what is what their role is in the exam. Where are they supposed to be looking? What are they supposed to be doing? So many of our cameras have uh, what we call an internal fixation. Uh, all that means is that there's a light inside the camera that your patient is going to look at. So it's really important that your patients know that they need to be looking for that light. And when they see that light, they should be focusing on it. If you have a handheld device with a blinking light inside the camera, it's really helpful for your patient to cover the eye that you're not taking a picture of 
So it's easier for them to focus on that light. If you have a handheld device and your fixation is on the outside of the camera, uh, you have like a glow in the dark dot on a rod that you'll move for the patient to look at. Uh, one thing that's really helpful is using a flashlight, shining that flashlight on the glow in the dark dot so that it shows up really bright in the dark room so the patients can see it more easily. So again, explaining to the patient where they're supposed to look and then ensuring that that blinking light or that dot on the outside of the camera is correctly positioned. So they're looking in the right location for the images that you're capturing. Okay, a couple more for you. Let us know what you think is causing the image quality issue here. You guys are getting faster at these. <laughs> All right, a couple more seconds and we'll lock in those answers. Okay. So this one also looks like it was a little bit easier to identify. You are correct. This is lens artifacts. So you can see on the image, there's a lot of dust and debris on the lens, causing um, a to not be able to see almost any of the anatomy on the retina. So a few more examples of a lens artifact or a dirty lens. Um, number one, again, it's dust or debris, but then number two and number three are a little bit different. So these look like they could be residue on the lens or maybe a smudge or fingerprint on the lens. So these all would need to be cleaned before taking more images of your patient's eyes. And we do have a specific way uh, we recommend you to clean, clean all the lenses. No matter what camera type you have, use the same process for everyone. So if you just have dust, which is the most common, um, it is easy for those lenses to get dusty, especially if they're not covered. If you just have dust, you only need two things to clean the lens. So you might be able to see me in the little uh, small window on the side of your screen, but you'll need your flashlight and your air bulb. And you'll use the flashlight to be able to visualize the dust on the lens. This is done most easily in a dark room. So you'll shine the flashlight on the lens and then use the air bulb to remove the dust. If your lens looks more like number two or number three, you're going to do the full cleaning process with which starts with your air bulb again. So use your air bulb and flashlight, remove any of those loose particles. And then you'll wanna follow up immediately with your lens wipe. So this is a Zeiss lens wipe. It is wet, has a cleaning solution on it. So you'll use that to clean the lens and then immediately following dry it with a Kintec lens wipe. So you don't want any of the residue to dry on the lens. That's kind of how you end up with uh, an image like number two or three. So dry it really well with that Chemtech wipe and then follow back up with your air bulb just to remove any loose particles. If you have any questions about that, put them in the Q&A box or anything else we've talked about. And we'll follow up with those at the end. Okay, so in this next example, just like before, we're going to give you a few moments to look at the image, and then you can tell us what you think is happening. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll so that you can make a selection. Tell us what you think is happening in this image. All right, just a few more moments. Give everyone a chance to lock in their votes.
Okay. So we'll go ahead and share the results. The majority of you answered correctly. This is an example where fog on the lens is obstructing our view to the anatomy. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the poll. So in this example, the fog on the lens is almost completely obscuring our view to the anatomy. We can see just a little bit of anatomy past it. These next two examples, um, have varying degrees of fog. Number one, again, this image is pretty much completely obscured. We can't see any anatomy past the fog. And the second image, uh, that fog is really obstructing our view to the inferior arcades and a good portion of the macula. So fog on the lens is a lot more common with those handheld devices, but we do sometimes see fog on tabletop devices as well. If your patient is wearing a mask, then fog is a lot more likely to happen. Sometimes you'll see the fog on the lens before you capture the image. Uh, sometimes you won't see it until after. So if you do happen to see it before the image is captured, you can just pull the handheld device away um, or pause the tabletop exam and allow the fog to dissipate from the lens. If you don't identify it until afterward, you're going to want to take a few steps to ensure that it doesn't continue to appear on the lens. So one of the first things you can do is check where the mask is landing on the patient's face. The higher that the mask is and the closer that it is to their eyes, the more likely that fog is going to appear on the lens. So we want to make sure those masks are down uh, covering the nose, but near the bottom of the nose. You can also have the patient use their forefinger to press down on the mask near the nose area to prevent the air from escaping from the mask and causing fog. Just be mindful that they're not placing their forefinger up underneath their eye because that will interfere with the seal of the eye cup. Uh, if you're comfortable with it and your organization is comfortable with it, you can also just have the patient remove their mask for the exam. That's completely up to you, uh, definitely based on your comfort and your organizational guidelines. Okay, I think this is our last one. So everyone take a look at this image and then let us know what is happening. All right, we're gonna launch the poll. Lock in your votes. All right, we'll go ahead and end the poll. All right, it looks like everyone is on the right track. This is eyelid interference. Great job. That means we've been training you well. <laughs> so on the next slide, you'll see a few more examples of eyelid interference. You can see it's at the bottom of the image. If you remember, all of these images are inverted. So you'll see an eyelid or eyelashes at the bottom. So you can see in number one and number two, there's some stripes or striations in those images that indicates it's eyelashes. Um, these can be caused by a couple of different things. First is ptosis or a droopy eyelid. Um, and then the second thing is it may be a partial blink. So you're, you captured an image in mid blink and your patient doesn't have droopy eyelids, they just were closing their eye. So if it is a droopy eyelid, there are a couple of things you can do. You can start with just coaching your patient to open wide. So when you get in position or you know your camera is about to take the image, just coach your patient open wide at that time. And usually that will help um, alleviate any kind of eyelid interference. If it is still droopy, you can do a few things. First, if your patient is able, they can lift up on their own eyelid for you. So I usually like to ask them to use their thumb and put it right in the um, top of their eyebrow and just slightly lift up. That usually keeps their hand out of the way of the lens of the camera. If they brought a family member or caretaker with them, that person can assist you. You can try and do it yourself if you're um, using a tabletop device, 
or if you can get a coworker to help you, that is the best option for those. All right. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned this, but I just want to highlight all of these images that we're showing you today in our presentation have been taken from exams that were submitted to IRIS. So these are real life examples of troubleshooting opportunities that we've identified. So these last examples are regarding camera positioning. And so we're going to break this out into a few different camera types uh, because we have a variety of cameras in the field. This first example is camera positioning opportunities with a tabletop device. So you may have a DRS or a Topcon or an Aiden camera. Those are all tabletop models that clients are using. Um, and so my joke about the tabletop camera is the hardest part about using it is ensuring that your patient is properly positioned. So typically camera positioning opportunities with a tabletop are directly correlated to patient positioning opportunities. Your patient is not correctly situated in the camera, and therefore it is causing those images to show up looking washed out, or they're having shadows that are clearly not dilation shadows. So these are two uh, key examples that we often see when patients are not correctly positioned. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for just a moment, and we're going to talk about just a few things that you can do to help ensure your patients are properly positioned. We have a DRS camera behind us, so uh, Rebecca is going to help me model some correct positioning. Do you want to spotlight the screen for them? All right, now we're taking up the entire screen. You can see us very well. So Rebecca is going to act as my patient. The first thing that we want to make sure, again, is that the patient understands their role in the exam. So we need to clearly explain to them what the expectation is in terms of their positioning. So Rebecca is already modeling one of the primary opportunities that we often see. The patient's forehead is not resting against the forehead bar. So a lot of times patient height is going to be the first thing that you want to adjust for. So we want to make sure that the table is an appropriate height. I'm noticing Rebecca's kind of having to strain a little bit to get into the camera. And so one thing that you can use as kind of a, a, a marking point is to make sure that the forehead rest is eye level with the patient. And so when I look at Rebecca, I can see that this table is too high. So I'm going to go ahead and lower it slightly. And now Rebecca can comfortably come forward. So you want your patient to come forward and slightly down. This way they can place their forehead all the way against the bar. You also want to make sure that their chin is centered in the chin rest. So this is another time that masks can make it a little bit more difficult for patients to understand where they're positioned um, because the mask might be covering their chin. It's very helpful to come to the side and look at your patient. So as Rebecca mentioned earlier, um, you know, when you're explaining the exam and getting things adjusted, you know, having the lights off, but the door cracked. So you can come and visualize how is the patient looking? Are they correctly positioned? It's also very important to ensure that you ask your patient, are you comfortable? If your patient is uncomfortable, they are likely to move during the exam and that can impact your image quality. So again, forehead against the bar, chin centered in the chin rest. Um, and then you'll be able to go ahead and perform the exam. All right. So I'll begin sharing my screen again for our next example. So the next example, we see two images from the Volk or Optimed camera types. So these are both handheld camera types. And you can see they both have kind of a glare at the bottom of the screen. So this glare is due to the camera positioning, specifically the angle of the camera um, versus the ceiling or the floor. So we um, typically recommend coming straight in to your um, patient where the barrel of the camera is level. But with this camera type, you actually have to use an angle. So we'll stop sharing and I will demonstrate this with Lauren so that you can see what it looks like. So just like any other camera, 
that is handheld, we always recommend um, balancing the end of the camera on your thumb. And this is going to allow you to use it as a pivot point. So you can move the camera up and down using your hand in the back or your thumb in the front. So if Lauren is my patient and I'm going to place my hand on her temple and land my camera on my thumb, as I move forward, I will tilt the camera back, kind of like I'm driving up a hill. That way I can eliminate that glare at the bottom. If you don't see any shadows at the bottom of your screen, that's a good indication that you won't get that glare. All right, perfect. We have one more example for camera positioning that we're gonna share. Um, just another reminder, please feel free to put any questions you might have in that Q&A box as we'll be answering them here in just a few moments. So on this last slide, we have camera positioning opportunities for the Remedio camera. The Remedio camera is also a handheld device, but it operates a lot differently from the Optimed and Volt handheld devices. So it's kind of in a category on its own. Uh, the Remedio is the handheld camera that has the iPhone on the back of it, just for your reference. So there's a few more opportunities for uh, camera positioning to affect the quality of the images. In the first example, the camera operator is not properly aligned with the retina. The camera, the front of the camera needs to go a little bit more to the right so that the retina is filling the screen. And so that shadow is obstructing our view to some of the inferior arcades and the patient's macula, um, affecting the quality of the image. The distance that you are from the retina can also affect the quality of the image. So in the second example, the camera operator has pushed too close to the patient. So you want the retina to fill the screen, but you don't want to push in too close. And one of the indicators that you're too close is you'll start to see some white hot glares on your image preview screen, uh, indicating that you need to pull back just slightly uh, so that you're not too close. And when you're too close, that image starts to look washed out, overexposed, as you see in the second example. The third example is a great example of when you are too far back from the patient. So blue, purple, or white shadows are gonna be a really great indication that you are not correctly positioned and that you need to push closer to the patient's eye. If you see shadows on your image preview screen, you're going to see shadows on your image uh, preview. So. Uh, it's a good indication when you're about to capture an image. If you see shadows on the preview on the image capture screen, you're going to see shadows on your actual image. This fourth image is a good example of the operator just being way too far back. Uh, in this example, we can see all of the patient's eye. We can't really see any of the retinal anatomy. Uh, this often happens when operators are afraid to push the device closer to the patient's eye. Uh, so it's really important to practice with your devices. Uh, conduct exams as often as possible, and also have your coworkers take your images from time to time as a reminder that this is not an uncomfortable or painful process. You're not going to poke anyone's eye out, um, but if you're too far back and uh, you don't capture any of the retinal anatomy, number four is a good example of what that looks like. So I'm going to stop sharing and we'll talk just a little bit more about some best practices. Just like with the other handheld camera, this is a two-handed process. So you're going to be holding your camera in one hand and using the other hand as a bridge to your patient and a means of balancing the device and pivoting. So you can use your thumb to go up and down or side to side, and you're going to be looking at your image capture screen. Unlike the... Uh, Volk and Optimed uh, cameras. This camera does not like to go up the hill. We want to stay nice and parallel with the floor. And we want to approach the patient at a slight angle. So when I place my hand at Rebecca's temple and I land the camera in front of her face, you'll notice I'm not coming straight on. I want to come at about a 30 to 40 degree angle. You can use the corner of the patient's chair as a reference point. And so when you place your hand on their forehead or temple, depending on which hand you're holding the camera in and which eye you're taking a picture of, you land the camera on your thumb. You can look at the image capture screen to visualize the patient's eye in your field of view. And then you just want to press the device toward their eye and you want to keep it parallel with the floor. 
And again, you can use your thumb to pivot left and right or up and down to make sure that you're lined up properly. And so there's kind of a sweet spot that you're looking to hit where the retina fills the screen and all the shadows go away, and then you can capture the image. All right, so it looks like we have received a few questions already in the Q&A. So we'll go ahead and start answering those. Feel free to put in any questions here now that we're coming to the end of the webinar. We do wanna make sure we answer any questions that you might have uh, either during the webinar or with a follow-up if needed. Okay, so the first question that came in, I believe um, was at the beginning when we were showing the two ideal images, one of the left and right eye. The question was, do we have an updated version of the camera that sees both eyes at one time? No, we were just, we just wanted to show you what both eyes looked like at the same time. So um, the cameras all will take an image of one eye and then the other. All right. The next question has to do uh, with using a red light in the uh, exam room. So um, they're wondering if the red lights affect the patient's dilation. So red lights are the least impactful to dilation, and that is why we recommend using a red light if you want to have a little bit of ambient light in the room during uh, the exam. One thing to be mindful of is that you don't want the light to be too bright. Uh, another thing to be mindful of is you don't want the light to be in the patient's field of view. So having the light behind them or in the corner of the room, um, if the light is directly in their field of view, it can impact their dilation. So uh, just making sure that that red light is kind of tucked in. So it is providing that ambient light, but it's not uh, at risk of impacting their dilation. So we got a question about um, patients. I'm sorry, I was reading the wrong question. Um, can you use drops instead of having a patient sit in a dark room? So that is a question for your organization. Uh, we don't make that decision for you. Some organizations do choose use, to use dilation drops and some don't. So ask your supervisor if you have dilation drops available. All right. Another question asks, if the patient is blind in one eye and cannot see the light, do we still take the image? Uh, our recommendation is to try to take images of the patient eye because diabetic retinopathy can still sometimes be detected. Um, obviously, we would not necessarily be able to um, save the vision for the patient if they have blindness in one eye. However, it can be an indication of other things that are happening in the body. So um, it's always worthwhile to try. If you're not able to, that's quite all right. You can always submit a single eye order, um, but there's, there's no harm in trying to capture an image of that patient's other eye. We got a couple of questions about whether or not this webinar will be available later through a recording? And the answer is yes. Um, we post all of these webinars to our YouTube channel and you can get the links to those in next month's webinar. I'm sorry, in next month's newsletter. All right. Uh, we also have a few questions regarding the Remedio cameras that have the blinking light inside the camera. So again, the Remedio camera looks like this. It's got the iPhone on the back of it. Um, and so the Remedio camera does have a different location uh, for the blinking light, depending on the eye that you're taking a picture of. And so I'm going to go ahead and just share our screen from our device so that I can show you very quickly where those uh, fixation points are located. All right. So here on the Remedio image capture screen, there's a grid of dots in the lower left-hand corner. When I tap on that grid of dots, I'm going to select one of two dots for the right or the left eye, depending on which eye I'm taking a picture of. So for the patient's right eye, I want to select the right center dot. And when I tap on that dot, the grid downsizes and I can confirm that it's the right center dot that was selected. For the patient's left eye, I'm gonna choose the left center dot. So that's gonna be the um, dot on the left-hand side of the plus sign. Those are the only two dots that you have to worry about. So the other dots are used for other types of exams, not a diabetic retinal exam. We're looking for a macula-centered photo. So those are the only two dots you have to worry about. 
Before you put that away, we had a question to uh, review the angle with the Remedio camera again. Absolutely. Like to do that as well. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, coming at about a 30 degree angle is very helpful. So you want to have your patients facing forward and looking at the angle to the side so that their pupil is isolated and you can align with it properly. And so when I'm approaching Rebecca, I'm going to place my supporting hand on her temple. And again, you may be placing your hand on their forehead, depending on which eye you're taking a picture of and which hand you're holding the camera in. When I land the camera in front of her face, you'll notice her head is facing forward. Her eyes are looking at a slight angle. And again, I'm just coming at about a 30 degree angle. You can use the corner of the patient's chair as a reference point. And I want to make sure that the image capture screen is in front of my face so that as I press the camera toward her eye, I can verify that I'm in the correct position. All right. Okay, so we got a question about getting a purple image on the Remedio device. That is common. It does happen every once in a while. The um, timing between the flash and the shutter is just not ideal when you get a purple image. So just retake the image. You shouldn't get that very often. Um, if you're finding that you're getting it more than one in every 50 or 100 images, please let our help desk know. All right, um, we've got a question regarding additional training. Uh, that is something that you should reach out to Iris for directly and we can coordinate any additional training sessions that might be needed. So uh, you can submit a ticket to our help desk or give us a call and we can get the ball rolling on that. All right, we have a question from um, a user who does in-home exams. They want to know if we have any suggestions for patients who don't have a dark room in their home. So it sounds like maybe they have windows in all of their rooms um, without any coverings. So obviously find the darkest place in the home, have them close their eyes for a few minutes. Um, and then I, when you go to do the exam, go ahead and have them cover the opposite eye immediately before they open their eyes. So then once you have your camera in position, kind of near their eye. So the eye cup is darkening the um, light for them, then go ahead and have them open their eyes. So I don't know if I articulated that very well, but have them close their eyes, bring the camera up and get it in position, have them cover the opposite eye before you coach them to open their eyes. That'll help a little bit there's not a whole lot you can do about um, patients without a dark room, but a little bit of trial and error, maybe you can get a few more images. Absolutely. And as we mentioned earlier, at, always submit the best images you're able to capture. So if you cannot capture an ideal image, especially with circumstances beyond your control, in-home visits, the patient doesn't have a dark room, or the patient has vision issues, take the best images you can and submit them. If there's pathology visible in the image, then that image is gradable. So we always wanna give the interpreting provider the opportunity to see as much anatomy as we're able to show them. Uh, so someone mentioned that not all the images we discussed today are on the troubleshooting cards. That is correct. Those cards were created uh, before uh, masks were more widely used. So there's not an example of fog on those uh, cards. Uh, we can always offer additional examples to you at any time. Uh, also, if you're having quality issues and you want us to review the issues that you're having and offer feedback and troubleshooting tips, we can always do that. Again, feel free to reach out to our help desk at any time if you need support with identifying stuff that's happening in the images that you're taking. Okay. You guys are have, have sent some great questions in. Here is another one. If a patient is not cooperating, um, can we just submit whatever we can? Yes, absolutely. If you cannot get the patient to focus on the correct fixation point or they're having trouble understanding your directions, capture the best images you can. If you get any anatomy, go ahead and send that in because you never know um, if there's pathology in that segment of the anatomy, and that would be a gradable image. 
All right. Someone is asking a question about uh, cancellation for exams. So a lot of our clients have exams in different types of situations. Some of them are doing them in a primary care setting. Some of them are doing in home. Um, but it is not entirely uncommon for a patient to cancel a visit, uh, particularly if that visit is just for a diabetic eye exam. As many of you probably know, patient education is a hurdle. Uh, so helping patients understand why they need this exam, particularly if they're not experiencing um, any vision issues can be a hurdle. So it's not uncommon uh, for that to happen. It can be really helpful to incorporate this exam into a primary care visit or a diabetic follow-up so that you're taking care of multiple things at the same time. Um, they're a lot more likely to um, attend those visits and then you can capture the images while they're there. Okay, so I have a question here about the remedio fixation um, for external fixation. So if you remember, those cameras have a sliding dot on a bar on the outside of the camera. So with those devices, the ideal place to start is with that dot all the way against the camera barrel. So you want to place the bar horizontal at 90 degrees and then slide the dot as close to the camera as you can. So Lauren got that device for us. Now, if your optic nerve is not on the screen at all, that's when you would slide, start to slide the dot out. If your optic nerve is in the middle of the screen, you would slide the dot closer to the camera. So one good tip with these devices, make sure you're pointing out the dot that you want the patient to look at. Um, you can also charge the dot, have it hold the flashlight on the outside of the dot. It'll start glowing a little bit more. Um, sometimes when your patient is looking for that fixation point, if you have the camera too close to their face, they can't really tell what you want them to look at. So hold it back a little bit, point at the dot, ask them if they can see it, and then move forward. It's also easy to forget to change sides when you change eyes. So I like to say, can you see the green dot every time I move to the patient's other eye? It helps me remember to move it because if they say, what, what, I can't see the dot anymore, that means I forgot to change the position. So that's um, some, a few things to keep in mind with that external fixation. All right, uh, another question about the placement of the optic nerve. Um, so the person's asking, what can you do when you don't see the optic nerve or it's not in the correct position? Um, as we mentioned earlier, making sure that either the blinking light or the external fixation is in the correct position. This is one of the most common things, particularly when you're switching from one eye to another. If you're using a handheld device and the light is blinking inside the camera, have your patient cover the other eye. It's really important. And then again, coax, coaching the patient and helping them understand that they should be looking for that dot or that light uh, so that when they see it, they can focus on it. If you have a patient that has some type of vision issue that's impeding this process, and these are the best images you can capture, you've done all of the troubleshooting, you can't get it quite perfect, you can submit the best images that you've taken, um, but you do wanna do some troubleshooting before you submit those. We got another question about when this will be available as a recording. Again, look for it in next month's newsletter. All right, another question regarding the number of images to capture. So how many attempts to capture a quality image are acceptable? That's gonna depend on your patient. So the good news is the flash from the camera is not causing the patient any pain. Um, it might be slightly annoying, but it's not gonna cause them any pain or discomfort. So taking multiple images of their eyes is perfectly acceptable. You do wanna be mindful that the more images that you take, the smaller their pupil is going to become. So as you begin to take images and that bright light flashes in their eyes when you capture the image, it will impact the dilation of their pupils. So if you have to take multiple images, you may need to pause in between those images to allow their pupils some time to dilate once more so that you can continue to capture uh, images. 
our recommendation um, is try not to capture more than three or four images per eye. Uh, it's unlikely that any images past that are going to be high quality. Um, but again, it is going to depend on your patients and the size of their pupils. That's why understanding what's happening in your images is so important. So you can accurately troubleshoot those and alleviate the issues that are happening to try to get those quality images. The handheld devices also allow for multiple images to be uploaded. So feel free to send two or three images per eye to help show a comprehensive view of the, the anatomy if you have been unable to capture an ideal image. Okay, so um, we just got a question that came in about the green glowing dot on the Remedio device. So just remember there are two versions of the Remedio camera. One has external fixation. Um, if you, I can hold that one up. External fixation with this. The other one does not have this bar. So you may have a different version of the camera. Um, so one has external, one has a glowing dot inside the camera. So keep that in mind. Um, if you have more questions about it, please let us know. But you may just have a different version of the camera. So we got another question about the um, some settings on the camera asking about the normal image or large image. If you have questions about the settings, please contact the help desk and we can make sure your camera is set up correctly. All right. So we're happy to answer any other questions you may have. It looks like we've gotten to all of the ones that have been submitted so far. I just wanna take a moment to thank all of you for joining us today. We hope that you have enjoyed the webinar and that you found it useful. Uh, there will be a survey at the end of the uh, session. So feel free to answer that. Uh, we ask for your feedback. We also ask for any suggestions for future webinar topics. We're always looking to make sure that we're bringing value to you as our clients and helping support you as you continue to help us uh, end preventable blindness. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we got a question about webinars. Um, are they monthly? We don't have one every month, but we do have a newsletter every month, and that's where you will find uh, the schedule if there is an upcoming webinar and you can register with that link. Right. Thank you everyone so much. We loved having you and uh, we will see you next time. Have a great day, everyone.